cell phone. If you have a cell phone or a pager, please either turn it off or set it to stun. Begin with Psalm 121. Esai Ezri meim Adonai oseshamayim va'aretz. Al yiten lamot raglecha, al yanum shomrecha. Hine lo yanum velo yishan shomer Yisrael. Adonai shomrecha, Adonai tzilcha al yad yaminecha. Yomam ha-shemesh lo yekeka ve'arech belayla. Adonai yishmarcha mikol ra yishmoret nafshecha. Adonai yishmar tzilcha uvoecha me'ata va'ad olam. I lift my eyes to the mountains. What is the source of my help? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. The Lord will not let your foot give way. Your protector will not slumber. See the protector of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. God is your guardian. He is your protection at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. God will guard you from all harm. God will guard your soul. You're going and you're coming now and forever. Baruch Dayan HaAmet, blessed is the truthful judge. Death has taken our beloved Leonard Yelsky. Friends grieve in their darkened world in their silence, there is lamentation. In their tears, there is loneliness. Lost in their sorrow, may they find the presence of loving friends. Hear them, O God, and be with them. For Leonard's love, which united so many people in life and which death cannot sever, for his companionship that we share along life's path and which continues through the tenderness of memory. For the gifts of his heart and mind, which brought joy and happiness, and is now a precious remembrance. For all of these and more, we give our thanks to God. Once again, in our grief, we listen to the voice of our sacred scriptures. It tells us of our nearness to God, tells us of our kinship with the Creator, in light as in darkness, in joy as in sorrow, in life as in death. Together let us recite the 23rd Psalm in English. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we gather today, a saddened throng, we also realize that we celebrate a life uh, well-lived, a colorful life, a life of a man with much character and who was a character in so many ways. And it's not just a sadness, it's a, it's a celebration as well. We begin by calling forward Leonard's grandchildren to read the poem, If, by Rudyard Kipling. Kipling was a poet in the late 19th and early 20th, century, 20th centuries. Was this passed out? Do you have this packet? Look at that picture on the front, huh? He's hoisting a sailor over his head. That was before barbells. I don't know about before barbells, but they didn't have barbells on the ship. He's hoisting up a, a sailor.
this was this was my grandfather's favorite poem and as my dad said it was also himself my grandfather himself um, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowance for their doubting too if you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about don't deal in lies or being hated don't give way to hating and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise if you can dream and not make dreams your master if you can think and not make thoughts your aim if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools or wash the things you gave your life to broken and stood and build them up with worn out tools if you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and loss and lose and start again at your beginning and never breathe a word about your loss if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew if you can force if to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them hold on if you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch if, ne if neither foes nor living friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. privilege to call forward two people to eulogize Leonard. First, we call forward his son Mitchell, and then his law partner of 40 years, Angelo Leonardo. Thank you all for being here today and this is going to be hard to get through I've had a lot of strength and a lot of weaknesses in these last couple of months and days so bear with me this is going to be my closing argument for my father Leonard Yelsky in the case of God versus Leonard Yelsky My family is so grateful to everyone who is here and who is not here. Finette and Zoe and Jacob, my sisters Judy and Lauren and our beautiful niece Skye, my brother Jeffrey and Eva and our beautiful mother Cookie. Your prayers and your words of comfort, they have meant so much to us over these last 11 months. There's so much I can say about Leonard Yelsky, and once I start, it's going to be hard to stop. So let me just start at the beginning. Leonard was born on January 8, 1931, to two Yiddish-speaking refugees whose families survived the pogroms of World War I. We cannot speak of my father, Leonard, without speaking of my grandmother and my grandfather, Sam and Kate Yelsky. Because my father, he loved his parents more than anybody I've ever known to love his parents. He worshipped them. And it was a hard scrabble life. He was born in 1931 in the midst of the Great Depression to a Yiddish-speaking family in a tenement house in Glenville. But we remember our loved ones from the stories they told us, and there's no shortage of Leonard Yelsky stories. That's why all of you are going to come back and join us to tell your own. Well, my, grandfa my, my father, he would say, uh, it was also in the middle of the Prohibition, he said, uh, my Zeta Yudo, that's a uh, grandfather in Yiddish for those of you who don't know 
he had a still because it was prohibition and at night he'd open up for business and all of the men and women in the neighborhood would come over with their tin cups he'd fill them up for a dime a dime was a lot of money back then he said everybody had to pay except the priest from St. Aloysius Then Grandpa Sam got a fish store, started to elevate our family. And Grandpa Sam would tell me, and Leonard would tell me, they would dress Leonard up in a little sailor outfit, like the guy on the Cracker Jack box. They'd fill the trunk of the Packard up with ice, and they'd go down to the food terminals and buy the fish for the day. And then they'd take it back to the store, and he had a man that worked for him that would trim the fish and get it ready to market. And uh, Grandma Katie became a legal secretary, a brilliant lady, my father always said. And they elevated themselves from the hovels of Glenville to Cleveland Heights. They made it. He moved to Tullamore Avenue, and Leonard started playing football for the Heights Tigers. And he loved his football because he could bash the bleep out of people and not get in trouble. Now our grandmother, Katie, many of you remember her. She was beautiful and my father. I never knew a man to worship his mother like he worshiped our grandma, Katie. She would always call him Lenny Boy and of course Lenny Boy could do no wrong. So after his naval service in Korea, and he loved that naval service so much, Leonard enrolled in Western Reserve University. He lettered in football. He married our beautiful mother, Cookie, his beloved wife of 56, almost 59 59 years. And they went off to Columbus. He got into Ohio State University College of Law. And my sister Judy was born um, in Columbus. And they came back. He graduated. My grandpa Sam bought him a desk a chair and a bookshelf. And that's how it began. And he gave his family the life he never had and we are so blessed for having Leonard as long as we have had him. I will cherish these last 11 months for the rest of my life. And as difficult as it was to look upon this strong and fearless man in his weakened state ill and weak I have to say to my sisters Judy and Lauren for myself for all of us my sisters unwavering beliefs and convictions that Leonard Yelsky would beat this like he beat everything else I am forever grateful Leonard beat all the odds. He died in his sickness as he lived his life so many times. Leonard might have been down, but Leonard was never out. You just couldn't count this man out. In his illness, he was down, but you couldn't count him out. And the caregivers at Heather Hill and Jaga Hospital were just amazed. These were, this was the end of life team. This is what these healthcare professionals did. They cared for people at the end of their lives and they were amazed at Leonard's strength and resolve. So I have to thank the caregivers at Heather Hill and my father's doctors, Dr. Raz, Dr. Jaffa and Dr. DeMarco for never giving up on Leonard they had never seen anybody with a post-stroke syndrome as old and as weak as Leonard fight as hard as this man fought. And it really was Leonard. It wasn't us. It was all him. I have to thank Janice Sims, my mother's caregiver, and Shana for getting my mother Cookie out to Heather Hill. Weather permitting, these ladies got my mother there three, four, five times a week sometimes weather permitting, and Cookie would always get her Dairy Queen on the way home. 
So Leonard did develop a fearlessness in the courtroom. And he was a man from the streets. He was educated. I can't say he was all that refined. And very early in his career, he met a bondsman named Frank Leonardo. And Frank Leonardo saw in Leonard the toughness and the fearlessness and the honesty and the street smarts, and they developed a relationship. Leonard sent all of his bonds to Frank, and when one of Frank's people needed a lawyer, he'd send them to Leonard. And now our families are so close. Angelo. Angelo. I gotta move on. You were a great friend and law partner for 40 years, Ange. And your family is so close to my family. And my family loves your family so much. Angela will talk about some of this more because I can't, but Leonard did things as a lawyer that will never be done again. <laughs> and he made a lawyer out of me, for which I am ever, ever grateful. He represented everyone from paupers and street urchins to princes Cleveland Clinic doctors to university professors to celebrities and rock stars and everyday people in between. And he was something else. There's so many stories to tell. I got to tell one more. When we were little kids in 1966, Leonard and Cookie bought a house out in Moreland Hills. And all of our relatives and friends lived in the Heights and Beachwood. And they said, you, this is insane. What are you doing out here? This is the country. And it was. There were no sidewalks, I mean. There were no bicycle paths. Our closest friend was a mile up the road. And Leonard and Cookie, they lived their whirlwind life. They would love to take their weekends off. And our babysitter was our dear, dear uncle, Uncle Joe D'Angelo, and his lovely wife, Maxine. And as we got older, we learned that Joe was from the hill, and his street name was Holy Joe, Holy Joe D'Angelo. Lauren would say, she learned what Joe did for a living as we got older, she would say to my father, she said, how could you, how could you let, a, let a man like that watch us? And Leonard would say, how could you be any safer? <laughs> So there's a few people I mention at the risk of not mentioning others. Leonard Yelsky, he was my best friend, and he was my hero. And when you work with your dad for 25 years, you learn a lot about your father that you might not otherwise know. And I learned that my father had a favorite poem that his grandchildren read to you. I learned that my father had a favorite author who was Mark Twain. I learned so much about his naval service. And Leonard's best friend, he was my best friend, and he was my hero. And I learned who Leonard's heroes were. Some of them are here with us, and some of them are not. But Leonard, his heroes were men like Elmer Giuliani. That was my dad's hero. Harold Wannell, Frank Leonardo, and James Willis. Those were the men that Leonard Yelsky looked up to. So I could go on, but uh, we're going to receive our friends and guests at my cousin Michael and Abby's house, and you're all invited. Don't feel strange or awkward. Come and join us. Tell us stories about Leonard. Have a drink and a nosh. Be with us today, because we need your friendship today.
I'm going to leave you with this. I mean, I can say without any hesitation and without any reservation whatsoever, my father, our father, Leonard Yelsky, he was, he was one hell of a man. I'm going to miss him. That's all I got, Rabbi. coming today. Um, I'm Sky. I'm Judy's daughter. Um, my name actually comes from Sam and Kate Yelsky. So yeah, S-K-Y. And I just, it's a fun fact. But um, one thing I wanted to say about my grandfather is that he is, he was a living legend. And now, you know, he's just a legend. But the love and the warmth and the support that he gave everyone, you know, not just his family, but everyone that he ever talked to and everyone that he ever helped and defended, um, it lives on through all of us. And, you know, it's sad to think about that physically he is not here with us, but that memory of him and that love and strength will carry his spirit through all of us. And um, I remember when I was real little, because I, I grew up with my grandparents, you know, I lived with them. And I remember every day he would, he would remind me of who I am and where I came from and, you know, his parents and my name's Sky, and he had a ring, the Sky ring, that hopefully one day I can get. But <laughs> he would remind me of what it means to be a Yelsky and, you know, why we're all here. And he believed education was very important. He always supported me and my two other cousins, Jacob and Zoe, and he was always very proud of us, no matter what we did, and I can defend that because, you know, I've not been the best, but he never got mad at me, he never yelled at me, he never, you know, was disappointed in me, and I love my grandpa more than anything, and I just wanted to say thank you for coming, and thank you for your support, and it means the world to all of us. I'm here uh, to talk to you um, about Leonard, the, the trial attorney, which is the uh, the person I knew and the person I worked with uh, for, geez, 40 years. But when I first met him in 1976, I was 26 years old. And first year law, I had just finished, and I asked my dad, Frank Leonardo, who had AAA bail bonds, who I should... Uh, I wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer, and I said, uh, who do you think I should go clerk for? He said, go work for Leonard Yelsky, and you'll learn how to become a good defense attorney. So I went over, and in those years, it was uh, Yelsky, Eisen, and Singer. And I went over, and I uh, told Leonard I wanted to work for him as, as his law clerk. And he said, well, the firm just hired a law clerk from uh, Case Western Reserve. He's on the... The editor of the uh, what is the law review, and we can't afford two uh, law clerks. But uh, I said my father said to work for you. I said don't worry about it. He goes well we can't pay you. I said I'll work for you know for the uh, the bail bonds and I'll take the assignments that you give to the Case Western Reserve guy. So um, Leonard said all right. So. 1976, Leonard had a big case in uh, Florida, and he gives us this assignment, how to, to suppress uh, consensual sound recordings when the uh, person that's making these recordings uh, dies before trial. 
in this case, under mysterious circumstances. But <laughs> nonetheless, he had made all these consensual recordings, which really nailed everybody in this conspiracy to import uh, tons of marijuana. And they had the shipment, they had everything. So he gives this, how do you uh, suppress this? He gives this assignment to me and the Case Western Reserve guy. And the guy from Case Western Reserve comes back with this treatise with footnotes and Fourth Amendment and everything you want to know about the Fourth Amendment. And I came back with the, this two-pager and um, I essentially said, you're not going to win the, the suppression of these sound recordings, but to win the trial, this is a great case. And I gave him a case right from the Fifth Circuit where he was going about government over-involvement, which went beyond entrapment, and that's when the government created everything, even the thought of creating this crime, which they did in this case, because they wanted to render two of these witnesses um, incompetent because they had been subpoenaed to testify before the committee that had reopened the investigation uh, in the, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. These were uh, big people, and they were represented by lawyers in uh, Atlanta and in Florida. So Leonard goes and he reads this case, and he comes out, and he says, I knew Frank wouldn't have a stupid kid. <laughs> and that's about as much of a compliment you, you were going to get from Leonard, ever. And uh, as the days went by, we, he was, this was a big case for him, and he began reviewing the witnesses and the facts of this case along against the case that I had given him. And it just was a perfect fit, and uh, he loved the case. And he had these conference calls with these lawyers from uh, Florida and Atlanta, and he included me in on them. We're getting ready to go, and he says, you know, why don't you come down to Florida with me? I said, uh, and you could be the law clerk for, for this trial. I said, that'd be great, Leonard, if you were paying me something, but you're paying me nothing. <laughs> you know. <laughs> He says, I'll pay all your expenses. Uh, and he gave me the uh, office uh, credit card. It was a gas card. <laughs> and I said, you know, I got a wife. And at that time, my son Frank was like a year old. I said, I have a wife and child. He goes, well, your brother's got a condo down there. It could be like a vacation. He goes, it'll be great. So we all went down to Florida. And, and, and sure enough, Leonard led the charge in this defense. and. Uh, we won the trial, he, you know, he, and he took charge of it. And there were big lawyers from all over, and it was a great experience. And he said, yeah, please put that on your resume. So we came back, and his partner said, uh, Leonard, we got to talk to you. And they went and closed doors. I, all I could hear was Leonard laughing, and then he called me in. It, it, evidently, in those days, a gas credit card for one month would be $100, $200. This was like for over $2,000. <laughs> You know, you could charge hotel rooms and clothes and everything. And Leonard loved that. And from that point on, uh, Leonard and I worked on all of his cases together. And um, we went on a lot of adventures, as he called them, all over the country, because he also represented uh, Arabian horses, as you read from the obituary. Re reading that obituary, incidentally, I thought he was an equine farmer, as opposed to a criminal defense lawyer. All about Arabian horses. That was beautiful. But uh, the Leonard I know is a criminal defense lawyer, and he was a good one. And as we were flying back from uh, California once on one of his cases, it was 1978, and I'm trying to learn wills and trusts for the bar exam uh, on these cassette tapes. And uh, Leonard said, what are you listening to? And I said, Leonard, i got to take the bar. I said, when I take the bar, I'm going to go out on my own. He goes, no, no, i got plans for you. Don't worry about it. So I'm, I'm studying for the bar, and I said, you know, Leonard, you got to let me re listen to these tapes. And he goes, hey, listen, if Eddie Walsh can pass the bar, anybody can. <laughs> and that was uh, a prosecutor back in those days. <laughs> he goes, you got to admit, you're smarter than Eddie Walsh, right? Right? And you know, just hounding me all the way back from California. So 1979, we're waiting for the bar results to come out. And Leonard is representing Dr. David Ucker, who's the head of gynecology for Grand Hospital in Columbus. And he was also an attorney, and he was the assistant county coroner 
for a Franklin County, and he was also charged with aggravated murder in uh, hiring a hitman to kill another doctor, an African-American gynecologist, for having an affair with his girlfriend, who was married to a psychiatrist. <laughs> and it was just, you know, a, a, a huge case in Columbus. And I'm helping Leonard prepare for trial, and Dr. Ucker comes in, and he says, uh, Angie, that's what he used to call me, and we had been working on this case for a couple months, he said, you passed the bar exam, and in those days, they had uh, score results. He goes, and you really did well, and I, I, I was just thrilled. So I told Leonard, I said, Leonard, I'm a, I'm a lawyer now. <laughs> I passed the bar exam. He goes, I know, I, I, it was like a big plan for you. I said, really? I said, because now is the time I'm going to start making some money. <laughs> and I got some big plans for myself. He goes, don't worry about it. He goes, you're going to become my partner. He goes, but first I want to give you these witnesses you're going to be handling, you know, in, in Dr. Rucker's case. I said, I'm becoming your partner. I said, what about your partners? He goes, he goes, oh, they're gone. He goes, it's going to be Yelsky and Leonardo from here on in. I, I said, wow. So that day I learned I passed the bar. I'd be handling witnesses in a major murder case. And... Uh, I'd become a partner with Leonard. So uh, it wasn't 50-50, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. But I'll tell you what, that year, 1979, we won the Ucker trial. I bought a home. I bought a new Cadillac. And I bought a Bronco uh, for, for Darlene. Yeah. And it was, uh, from that, from that uh case on we tried a lot of cases together over the years all over the country you know from uh, in Florida and in New York we represented this company called Cuyahoga Demolition Cuyahoga Wrecking Cuyahoga Wrecking Corps of America they started in Cuyahoga but they went on to become one of the biggest demolition companies in, in uh, the world and they were headquartered in New York just another Ye Leonard Yelsky story and the boss was Phil Schwab, who lived in New York, great guy. And we were at the Four Seasons for brunch uh, one Sunday. And they have this magnificent, beautiful Four Seasons. I mean, what a restaurant. And there's Leonard in line with uh, a couple witnesses. And Leonard's always focused on the case. And he's talking about the, with these witnesses, what their, their testimony's got to be at these depositions. And there's the silver platter that has the trays for this magnificent uh, brunch there with crab and everything else. Well, the little tr uh, plates they had run out of, and Leonard's just talking. He just takes the entire serving tray. <laughs> you know, he just takes it, he's talking, he's just loading crab meat. <laughs> Boom. And, and the maitre d' from Four Seasons comes up, just horrified. Leonard has this huge serving tray full of crab meat and everything else. And as Leonard was uh, famous for saying in those days, what do I know? What do I care? You know? We just took the entire tray and we put it at our table at this magnificent restaurant, the Four Seasons. Everybody else was appalled. But uh, like Mitchell said, he was a great... Um, person to learn from and towards his uh, the later years Leonard's now like in his late 70s early 80s and I'd be trying cases and I'd look in the gallery and I'd see Leonard sitting there for closing argument or something and it was it always made me a little bit nervous that you know I didn't want to make any mistakes in front of him but after one of them he said now he goes now uh, you're teaching me things and I said no Leonard you'll always be the teacher So to all of those uh, words spoken, beautiful words of tribute and remembrance, and many of them which bring a smile to our face, which is what you need at this time. These things fill you up. These memories fill you up and help you in your times of sadness. Let us say amen. 
So usually the rabbi delivers a eulogy, and usually the rabbi has things to add. I am just going to say, Amen. If you want to convert to Judaism at this point, this would be, we'll be thrilled. All right? You can just become a member of our congregation right now. We thank God for the, the long life of our dear Leonard Yalski. The last year was very difficult, and we're adults here. Even those who are children are adults in this situation. We are grateful that he breathed his last, finally. It had been a long time, and we uh, thank God for the gift of this life. And as we think of Leonard, be kinder, be more thoughtful, be a teacher. You know, I don't eat crab, but, you know, feel free to eat some crab. And so we conclude with words from the first chapter of the book of Job. Adonai Natan, Adonai Lakach, Yehi Shem Adonai Mavarach, the Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Please rise for El Malay Rachamim prayer. Into your care, O God, we entrust the spirit of our dear Leonard Yalski. For you, O God, keep faith with your children in death as in life. Sustain us that we may meet with serenity the mysteries that lie ahead, knowing that when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you, O oh God, are with us, a loving friend in whom we put our trust. You are the light of our life, our hope in eternity. El male Shochen bamromim, hametzem nocha nechona, tachak anfe hashchina. Im kedoshim utorim, kezoharaki amasirim, et nishmahat laser ben shmuel. Shalach lolamo Baal harachamim Yasti rehu beseta kenafab Loholamim Vayitz roho bits rohachaim Et nishmato Adonai hunacharato Vianuach bishalom al mishkavo Amen. Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to our dear Leonard Yelsky. Laser Ben Shmuel. He has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge in the shadow of your wings, and let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace, and let us say, Amen. In a moment, we will go in procession to Mount Olive Cemetery. Leonard will be buried in the Jewish War Veterans section. We will place the casket in the ground. We will escort its body to its final resting place. We believe his soul returns to God to be with the souls of his dear loved ones and the ancestors of our people. We're sending along a couple of well prayed from prayer books from his, uh, his family and one even an old Yiddish book. If you are not able to go to the cemetery with us, and you want to meet us at uh, Michael and Abby's house, we'll be there in about an hour and 15 minutes from now. We'll recite Kaddish for him at the grave, and we will recite Kaddish at Temple Israel near Tamid for the next 30 days. He'll be on the Kaddish list at other congregations as well. This concludes our service here at the funeral home and we will go in procession to the cemetery.